Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're going to be doing another episode of our um, kind of speculation things. I did a poll on this and everyone wanted to see it so here it is. We've got our DLC ideas uh, which I'm really, really excited to go through. So I put six packs of uh, different uh, time periods and animals and things like that. So I'm going to get started to stuck into this one. So this is our speculation uh, episode. So these animal packs is what we're going to be doing it on. So we've already done the speculation of the roadmap. We did the free updates. We also did the uh, story DLCs, which I'm still quite proud of and updated those. But we've, uh, everyone's asked for it, so we've got the animal packs. So have a look at some of the wonderful animals that we can include into Jurassic World Evolution 2. So based on past packs each pack will have four prehistoric animals based on a theme so it'll be time period diet taxonomy etc so that's been pretty good like the early cretaceous pack late cretaceous pack of the diet time period cretaceous predator packs actually kind of both of the uh, time period and diet uh also taxonomy there's other things uh, that i'll get into as well so all of those based around those kind of themes Next one as well is may come with new behaviors and feeders. So some DLCs, obviously the bigger ones, have come with some very different animals like the Demetrodon and Lystrosaurus. But um, even the smaller packs have come with like a new feeder. So like the Jehalopterus uses the insect feeder, which I think should be expanded to other animals. But anyway, so that we can get potentially new feeders. I'm trying to keep this as realistic, uh, but as like uh, optimistic as possible. So that's the best way to put it so it's kind of like the best of all things and trying to create some really great uh, pack ideas so yeah hopefully you guys enjoy those um, each animal needs to be at least semi-popular or bring some diversity into the roster and have something distinctive about them to make their addition worth it so i try to not like not have like zujing tyrannus or anything that's just like really um uh, just the same thing, but like different continent. Very similar. I'm trying to keep away from very similar animals, but if they've got a bigger name, I did include them. So animals, I did use a mix of both highly requested animals, but also trying to add ones that are weird and distinct enough that I think is worth an addition. So trying to look for really interesting animals that can actually be gameplay different wise instead of just clones, quote unquote. But there, are, there is a couple of quote-unquote clones, I'd say, but it depends. It's it's it's, it's my opinion. It's opinion back. so if you guys have uh, other you know, thoughts or anything like that, you obviously put them in the description below. And to clarify, there's no extinct mammals or other groups that do not fit in the JP canon. So I tried to keep this pretty much restricted to every th animals that are groups that are already in the game. So we've got fish. Uh, I did put a couple fish in there, just spoiler. Uh, because we've got Dunkleosteus now, uh, some synapsids, uh, a few other animals, but no mammals, no like invertebrates, like no sea scorpions, no Meganeura, nothing like that. So I'm trying to keep it to animals that we already kind of have in the game. So yeah, I think that kind of goes through the, the ground rules. But also credit to the modders and artists for the pictures I used. A lot of really, really awesome pictures like Dragon Thunders, Gabriel, uh, Tosha did uh, one coming up as well. So that's Clue, it's a marine reptile. Uh, I don't want to go too much into what they painted, but I just wanted to make sure they all get credit because they all did a really wonderful job, and I think it did really, really awesome. So let's get started. So first up, we're starting with the Jurassic Dinosaur Pack. They would rather call it Jurassic Animal Pack because there's only one dinosaur in this pack. Uh, spoiler. So we'll be starting off with the only dinosaur in this pack and probably the most highly requested dinosaur in the game so far um, that I've, I've read so far. So we've got Platysaurus. So Platysaurus is a medium-sized herbivore, about 10 meters long. So comparable in size to a lot of those uh, Ornithischians and some of the smaller sauropods. And it is typically found in Europe. As I mentioned, it's really highly requested. And it's also early bipedal sauropodomorph. So it's kind of one of those really weird pro sauropods, what they used to be called now. They're just called sauropodomorphs. So they were some of the early relatives that were leading towards the bigger sauropods. And Platysaurus is kind of the most famous member of that. So they have that almost like they're getting that really long tail and long neck of the sauropods. But they're also not quite walking bipedally, uh, quadrupedally yet. So at the moment they are walking on their uh, just the hind limbs. So you can see they've got like big claws going on. A really, really interesting animal. I think it's definitely worth adding. And plus it was walking with dinosaurs. so And just generally pretty famous. So I think it's a really great addition for a pack like this. 
And next up, we've got something that's not quite as famous, but I think still quite interesting. We've got Lusha Wikia. I believe you say that. Lusha Wikia. I believe that's how you say that. So it's another one from Europe, but it's from a little bit later in the uh, Cretaceous. I'm uh, not the Cretaceous. Uh, Jurassic. And it's also from Europe. It was described in 2019. Uh, it was found earlier, but it was in Poland. So that's where it's kind of from. And it's the largest known dicynodont and non-mammalian or non-mammal synapsids. So synapsids are the group that includes mammal-like uh, reptiles, or uh, we just use synapsids, or those mammal-like reptiles like Edaphosaurus, Dimetrodon, uh, things like Gorgonopsids, things like that. And then that obviously leads into the modern mammals that we have today. So things like uh, pretty much all your modern mammals, are humans, uh, elephants, whales, primates, uh, rats, and uh, Afrotheas, and all, the, all, that, all that really cool stuff. But the reason I picked Lusha Wikia, I was thinking of putting Placeria since a little bit more famous, but this is much larger. So Lusha Wikia was huge. It was actually pretty big. It was about five meters long. Uh, as you can see, it's a very big bulky body and about seven tons. So it's comparable in size to modern day elephants. So it shows that even back then it was huge. It was probably one of the biggest, the biggest animal for its time. And... Um, also shows like it's good comparison because we've got uh, Lystrosaurus, which is quite a bit smaller, and then we've got the biggest one of all. But um, Placerius was kind of in the middle. It was uh, probably about one or two tons, uh, not even probably not even that. It was kind of in between the size of the biggest uh, Lysowicia. So you get the biggest and kind of one of the smaller ones, and I think it shows that even in, back in the Jurassic, we had some pretty big animals to contend with. And as I mentioned, the largest non-mammalian synapsids. So. Barring anything like whales and elephants and indricotheres and some of those really large, like weird uh, mammals that you can think of off the top of your head that get to about seven tons, which is pretty much those intricothere animals, whales, intricotheres, things like that, they would have been the largest. So it shows that even back then they were getting quite big. And if maybe if things turned out different, we would have had synapsids ruling the Mesozoic. Uh, if we didn't have the Interassic extinction, it could have been a very interesting time. The Jurassic itself is just completely underrated, I think. And then we also get another large synapsid. So I did include some synapsids in here. So we get a good diversity. And um, part of this is packs, these packs as well. I want to add diversity to things that are kind of poorly represented. Because like synapsids, we have two. So I'm trying to add things and put more diversity in things that are places I think needs it. So I think it's really cool. So next up, we have got for the Jurassic Dinosaur Pack, even though it's a little bit misleading, we got Pososuchus. So this guy is a small to medium sized carnivore, depending on estimates. I imagine being Jurassic Park will go bigger. So about seven meters or five to seven meters or so. And it's from North America. And uh, is a Rarosuchid, which is a group of like crocodile morphs. So the Archosaurs, was pretty much the T-Rex of its time, you could say. One of the largest Jurassic predators. There are some Rarosuchids that did potentially get bigger. Things like Smok, which lived with Lysowicia. But also, um, like Falsosuchus. It could have potentially got 10 meters long, but probably a bit more fragmentary. But this is kind of up there with the larger ones. And so it's basically the big top predator of its time in the Jurassic, which is really interesting. And it also increases the non-dinosaur diversity. So we get like a really, we almost get like a teaser dinosaur because these were very much in that niche. Like you can see it's very superficially, very dinosaur-like and uh, gives us another one. And there's a couple mods of it. It's very highly requested and also quite popular because of walking with dinosaurs and uh, when dinosaurs roamed America, I think it was in that or a relative. Um, but yeah, a really cool animal. I think it's definitely worth adding. Uh, and nice big predator, definitely cool. And last but certainly not least, we've got a marine animal this time. So we've got Placotus. So Placotus is a really cool, like early Jurassic or just Jurassic marine reptile. There are a lot of very interesting ones, kind of in the vein of Nothosaurus. Uh, it's a small marine reptile, about three meters, probably a, a bit smaller than the um, Ichthyosaur, but we'll get to why it's interesting. It's from Eurasia. And is a very unique Jurassic marine reptile, as it was a Bethnic feeder. So uh, it kind of, as you can see in this picture, it kind of grazes along the seabed, and is considered what is called Durophagus. So it has really, really round teeth that were really well adapted for crushing hard-shelled foods. So Durophagus is kind of a misleading term because it just means eating hard food. So an animal that eats seeds and an animal that eats uh, shellfish is both considered durophagus, it just means hard things. So they are fed on 
mainly things like uh, clams and mollusks and most mostly those kind of hard shelled and mussels those kind of hard shelled animals and with the addition of this animal we get a new feeder and similar in the vein to jailopterus in the um, feathered species pack we get a new uh, uh, new sh uh, shellfish feeder I mean that can be at the bottom and they come graze and be and it could also be used other species such as Archelon so Archelon was also believed to be at a ecology quite similar to loggerhead sea turtles and they're known for eating clams and things like that as well so it could be another thing that it could use so I think that's a really cool addition and gives us another feeder so I think it's pretty cool Jurassic dinosaur pack pretty cool Pretty much, yeah, I'd say that's pretty much what I originally considered instead of Meeple Plus Serious, but the Suwakia is a bigger one. I'll talk about some of the animals that you could substitute as I go through. So next up, going from the Jurassic to the Jurassic Dinosaur Pack. So starting off with uh, Torvosaurus. Uh, these are the, the first ones that my master do, the next one, America Ice, my Leviathan. So really, really awesome mods that are already in the game, which I thought I'd use. So Torvosaurus is quite a large carnivore, so up there with T-Rex and Caracarodontosaurus and Giganotosaurus and all those big boys. In the game already, Tarbosaurus as well, got up to about 10 or 11 meters or so. And it's from North America and Europe. I've kind of gone through over it a few times because there's been quite a few mods of Torvosaurus. So that shows us how desperately everyone wants it to be added. And I'd say it's the only notable large carnivore not in the game. Like if you think in your head, uh big animals that is using tyrannus which is very mm, like uh it's basically just another asian t-rex but we already got that with tarbosaurus um some of the other cacarodontosaurids that were quite big like tyrannotitan and megaraxes they're still quite similar to um obviously giganotosaurus and cacarodontosaurus so i think that's pretty well covered uh but we've got megalosaurus which uh is in the same group as Torvosaurus. Torvosaurus is a megalosaurid, and it was kind of the largest member of that group, one of the biggest predators of the Jurassic. So I think this is the perfect opportunity to add it here. And I think it adds a lot of diversity, because we've just got Megalosaurus now, and this is like a giant Megalosaurus that lived in the Jurassic and is up there in a really good headliner, because it's a big carnival. We, we know Jurassic Park loves its big carnivals. Very, very awesome. So next up, also as well, from the uh, same areas, we've got Miragaya, which is a medium-sized herbivore. One of the largest stegosaurs, about 6 meters long, but still considered medium. From North America and Europe as well. So there are some relatives. Uh, it's mainly described from uh, Portugal, which is in Europe, of course. But uh, there is some remains that believe it could be like Miragaya, or potentially some lupping that could be the same species as Miragaya in North America. And I'd say it's the really or same vein with the Torvosaurus. It's the only really large stegosaur that's not in the game yet because we've got Rorosaurus, you know. Uh, and a lot of people have been requesting it. It is quite highly requested, so that's why I kind of put it here as well. One animal I thought of putting on here is Skeletosaurus, which is like a, if you guys have seen Prehistoric Kingdom of those guns, it's like a early, like, Thyreophoran, which is the group that includes Ankylosaurus and Stegosaurus. It was right before they were getting quite armored, and it was quite big, about four meters long, but still walked on two legs. Uh, or was still bipedal, so that would have been interesting. But I substitute it for a better animal, or I substitute that for a different animal in another pack, which we'll get into. So yeah, that's our two dinosaurs for the Jurassic pack. And next up, we've got another highly requested pterosaur. So I know we guys love our pterosaurs. So we've got Ramphorhynchus, which was a small pterosaur, about two meters, bigger than um, Jehalopterus and Dungepterus, I believe, but still got a pretty uh, smaller side. And remains have been found from Europe and Africa, and it's quite highly requested because it uh, increases that diversity of early long-tailed pterosaurs. Most of the pterosaurs in the game that we have, barring kind of uh, Dimorphodon and uh, Jalopterus, are all pretty much uh, the later Cretaceous pterosaurs with the short tail. Uh, but this kind of increases the diversity of those ones. Plus, it's highly requested. It's popular because of walking with dinosaurs. And really increases the diversity of pterosaurs. So I think it's definitely a worthwhile addition. And plus, it just looks really weird. It's got that long tail. And it's got those big teeth. I think it's a really interesting addition. And then for our marine animal, we've got Temnodontosaurus. So Temnodontosaurus is named from quite a few species. But um, they range from about like 8 or well, I think even 5 like to 10 meters long. So decent side. It's kind of in the middle between Shonyosaurus, which is like one of the larger, if not the largest, ichthyosaurs. And then like your typical ichthyosaurs like Ichthyosaurus and Ophthalmosaurus. 
kind of in the middle there and is known from europe and south america and why i think it's a great addition as well is because it's a macro predatory uh ichthyosaur so there are some species of Timnodontosaurus that are quite big and bulky and seem to be adapted for eating larger prey macro predatory means adapted for eating larger animals and while shonisaurus was probably uh still a large predator in his ecosystem it was uh, probably more like a sperm whale in its ecology, like a, a modern sperm whale. Uh, more kind of eating squids and things like that. Maybe not quite as uh, macro predatory, because it was simply just the biggest thing in its ecosystem. Would it be eating animals smaller than itself? But Timnodontosaurus, as you can see here, this great picture is kind of showing it eating the head of a uh, plesiosaur. So I think that would be a great animal to use for like adding diversity within the ichthyosaurs. It's kind of in the middle between ichthyosaurus and shonisaurus. It's macro predatory, so it can hunt bigger things. It's like it's it's like almost fight other animals even instead of just dying or just being too big to kill. And uses the shark feeder as well, so it adds a bit of variety there. So we get another uh, diverse, more diversity added to the ichthyosaurs. And it, and I think it's a good middle ground because we've got little ichthyosaurus and then the giant shonisaurus. Tamnodontosaurus is kind of that perfect middle ground. It's a little bit more predatory, and I think it adds like a good, good more diversity into that group, which I think is quite cool. So that's a Jurassic pack. So we've got the Jurassic Jurassic. What's the next one? Next one, we've got the Pterosaur pack. So going out from the time periods, uh, I think pterosaurs definitely deserve a bit of love. I imagine if you guys have seen my free updates uh, episode, uh, or episode of this, I would like to see uh, potentially this come out with the pterosaurs in the same vein as the prehistoric marine species pack came out with all these aquatic updates. I think it'd be cool to have the pterosaur pack come out with a lot of pterosaur updates to really give them some love because I think they do deserve some love. Uh, we've definitely missed out. I think with the, the marine species definitely got some love and they do deserve a lot more love. I think the pterosaur is kind of a little bit waylaid at the moment. And I've put some really cool pterosaurs in here. So I'm pretty happy with this. So the first one here, we've got Ludodactylus. So this guy is a medium-sized pterosaur, about 4 meters. So kind of uh, in between uh, medium size, And it's from South America. Most pterosaurs are from South America. Uh, a lot of them are. And this one, I picked this one because it's so weird. It's, it actually looks like the most stereotypical depiction of a pteranodon or pterodactyl as you see in movies they've got like pteranodon crests with big teeth but they actually unironically look like that which i think is really weird it's actually an ornithochirid uh, relative so it's ornithochiridae so it's related to ornithochirus tropicnathus uh those kind of animals but uh it's like literally looks like a pteranodon with big teeth which I think is cool, and that's why I think it should be added, because it looks like that stereotypical pterodactyl that you see in movies when, uh, with, like, just tread on with big teeth. I think it, it looks exactly like that, so I think it's definitely worth an addition. Next one as well, uh, we got Thalassodromus, uh, which is another medium-sized pterosaur, a little bit bigger, about 5 meter wingspan, and is also from South America. But I think what really also makes it distinct as well, it was an omnivore, same with kind of Tepijara, as I mentioned in the, um, uh, it's free updates pack. It was a, believed to be an omnivore, omnivore slash herbivore, so it could be eating like fruits and uh, nuts and things, uh, which is quite interesting as well. Uh, maybe even like uh, more like uh, shoe bill, not shoe bills, uh, like oyster catchers and potentially things of that kind of ecology, feeding on uh, things in the mud, that kind of thing. So they could use land feeders as well and come up at heat on land. It, if, if they go with the more herbivorous angle, I think that would be really cool. Because that would add more diversity into the pterosaurs, as long with having Tapijara being able to do it. And another reason as well, it's got a really, really distinct crest. got a really tall one with the two divots in there. I think that really adds a lot of interesting diversity. And next up, so the other two pterosaurs. Uh, this is a little bit more diverse. So we've got Pterodostro. So Pterodostro will be the smallest pterosaur in this pack, with a wingspan of about 1.5 meters. But what really makes it famous and highly requested, it was a filter feeder, very akin to modern flamingos. So it has all these kind of bristle teeth going along, as you can see uh, along there. So those bristle teeth would have allowed it to be able to filter feed uh, from more small, like uh, zooplankton, small algae, small fish. Uh, just anything small, really. Very similar ecology to a lot of waterfowl and, as I mentioned, flamingos. So I think that really adds a lot of diversity in what these animals will be eating as well. And you also get a new feeder. So as I mentioned, I like talking about feeders. 
so we get like a pond slash mash uh, marsh feeder so i can imagine it com- almost like the forage feeder in planet zoo or potentially like a feeder that's like with a rock in the middle uh, and then it can have an animation of it lands on the rock or lands on something and then it just puts its head in the water and does like a skimming animation or something like that just puts its head in the water and then kind of filters it out you can see water dripping off it as it filters like food out and eats it so i think that would be a really really cool addition uh and just adds more diversity to the pterosaurs and then we've got another big uh pterosaur that's also been uh, requested a lot so quetz isn't all by himself we've got hexagopteryx so hexagopteryx is quite a large pterosaur as well uh, about 10 meter wingspan estimates so comparable in that to quetz so very similar to quetz in size but the main difference as well other than a lot of other larger starkids were very similar to quetz uh, this guy lived on Hatsig Island, which was kind of like an island full of dwarf dinosaurs. So this kind of almost took like a macro, top apex predator, or it was like the T-Rex of Hatsig, you could say. So it was the biggest like predator of its uh, area. And um, that's allowed it to have like a much larger head and a shorter neck. So it was much more bigger and bulky, you could say, more much more robust to be able to deal with hunting bigger animals. And um, yeah, it could, these estimates it could swallow uh, animals up to 70 kgs whole, so that could be pretty much the size of a small person or even average sized person. So that's pretty uh, interesting in that regards. And I think to also make it more distinct from quets, because quets can attack uh, all sorts of different animals, can attack like hadrosaurs, things like that. I think it'd be quite cool to have he- uh, Hexagopteryx actually attack larger animals. Like it'd be cool to see it attack maybe like ankylosaurs. Or even like ceratopsians, small sauropods, uh, just to make it more distinct. Maybe even be able to fight larger theropods, be able to like fight, you know, T Rex and things like that. I think that would really make it distinct and add a lot to pterosaurs in the game, along with pterodostro. So I think that's a really well developed pack. I think the packs pretty much stayed the same as I first envisioned it. So this is the one that's probably that, and I think uh, some of the other ones is the least revised. So yeah, I think that's pretty good. That and the Jurassic one. So those are the two most stable ones that I haven't changed much. Jurassic changed a little bit. And uh, the Terrasol packs, all right. So next up, we are going to go to the Paleozoic packs. So uh, we already had these packs. So we've got some Paleozoic animals now. We've got Dunkleosteus. We've got uh, a Dimetrodon and uh, Lystrosaurus from the Permian. So I think they deserve some friends. So we're going to be starting off with the Paleozoic pack. We've got Edaphrosaurus, which was a large herbivore uh, for its time, but only about 3.5 meters long now. It came from North America and is kind of very popular. If you uh, see any documentaries with like uh, with the uh, with, with the Permian and Dimetrodon, it's kind of always paired with the Lephrosaurus because it's like the herbivore version and potentially its prey. And what's really cool is very popular. It's been very popular for like hundreds of years, uh, even a hundred years or so. In the Central Period, lots of painting of them. So it's very popular in walking with dinosaurs and I maybe mean, walking with beasts. Uh, w- not walking with beasts, walking with monsters, and uh, a few other documentaries and things like that. It's a very worthwhile animal, I think, adding. And also being one of the very first uh, vertebrate land herbivores. So typically that role was taken by things like Arthropleura uh, back in the Carboniferous. They were the biggest land uh, herbivores. But then these guys kind of came onto land and became one of the first big land herbivores with big guts and a gut flora that would allow them to digest cellulose and uh, allow them to eat plants. And um, lived, as I mentioned, lived with Dimetrodon, so that gives Dimetrodon uh, animal and its ecosystem that it can be in the game with, and is very large as well, so very likely prey for it as well. Seen a walking with monsters, and still quite famous in general, so I think it's definitely worth an addition. Next one as well, uh, we got Scutosaurus. So Scutosaurus is another large herbivore, a little bit shorter than uh, Edaphosaurus, and a little bit later in the Permian, but still quite large in that regard. I think it's very, very cool just how big it is. But it's almost like an ankylosaur before there are ankylosaurs. So these guys came from Asia. They've been mainly found in Russia, and they're quite large and heavily armored, as I mentioned. So pretty big for their time. One of the largest pariasaurs of the time. So these guys aren't sun- so. Edaphosaurus was a synapsid, so same as the Metrodon, the Wikia, animals like that. 
But Scutosaurus was a parasaur, which we don't know if it was an episode, but they mean they have no holes in the skull. That's a whole taxonomic mess that I won't get into. But it was in her own group of pariasaurs and was one of the largest members of those group and one of the largest animals in the Permian. So about three meters long and about just over a ton. So still very big animals, uh, large and heavily armored. So I think that adds to it as well. And quite famous in popular culture as well. One of the more famous Permian animals uh, seen in Primeval and Walking with Monsters. Uh, so I think that's also a really worthwhile addition. And because it lives with the next animal here. So we've got here for the Paleozoic pack. We've got the big carnivore. We've got Enostransevia, which is another large carnivore, about three and a half meters. It's found in Africa, uh, Asia, but recently found in Africa as well. There's been an African species of Enostransevia. Uh, I can't even say it now. Enostransevia. Why did I say that wrong? Enostransevia. Yeah, Enostransevia. So it's an African species just described in um uh i think last year actually so just last year we had an african species which is pretty cool and is considered the largest of all the gorgonopsids which are a group of really interesting uh early like synapsids that were big predators in the permian so these were the ones that witnessed the great dying so a little bit sad but uh they were the largest of the gorgonopsids about three and a half meters and gorgonopsids are quite famous for having the saber tooth look. So they're the first animals to develop that kind of ecology. Later on, a lot of other synapsids, such as lots of cats, would develop it, as I mentioned, like uh, barbophilids. Uh, Smilodon is the most obvious example. Of those macarotus, uh, macarodonts would have all had that kind of design. It evolved five or six times separately within the uh, synapsid lineage, but these were the first to develop it. So they would use these large saber teeth to potentially bite into rip into prey, or even like bite into their throat, especially when they live with such heavily armored and big animals as well, especially like Scutosaurus, and Scutosaurus did live with uh, Instrancevia. And then were made interesting as well. And also, it's quite popular. It was seen in Life in Our Planet. Uh, Primeval had a big Gorgonopsid, which would have been most comparable to Instrancevia. Uh, so I think it's a really interesting, cool animal, and being the biggest, you know, it's worth adding. Uh, it's still three and a half meters, so the same size as like a tiger. So really, really cool animal. I think it's worth as well. And last but certainly not least, we've got an aquatic animal. So we've got Halicoprion. So Halicoprion was a Eugenodont fish, quite large, about eight meters long. So it was like a relative of early ratfish and chimeras, which are alive today. So an early relative that got quite big during the Permian, and has been found worldwide. And there was pretty much like for a hundred years or so, we had no idea how to reconstruct it. And we've only recently just figured out how it uh, works. So you can see these tooth whorls in their mouth here. We actually just found out in the last few decades that it was actually used uh, to actually uh, be able to hunt, uh, use suction feeding to be able to hunt things like nautiloids and ammonites. So what they'll do, they'll kind of use the tooth whorls to bite and rip them out of their shells and eat it. So it's a very interesting ecology there. But being big sharks, they probably ate whatever they get their mouths around. Uh, and those tooth whorls just really make them more interesting. And I think that kind of reconstruction from Wikipedia is a really, really nice rendition of how it looked accurately. And big animal too, eight meters. So another big animal for this pack. And uh, I think it'd be cool to add a new feeder as well. We could use the squid or ammonite feeder. So you could just have squid as another variety. A lot of animals could use it. Uh, just to add more diversity, because I think the lagoons definitely need a bit more diversity. And yeah, Helicoprion is a good excuse for that, since their kind of thing was for eating shoff shelled uh, animals like ammonites and nautiloids, where they were able to kind of rip them out of their shell. So it's a really interesting adaptation, and I think it's a way to add it into the game. And then you can have squids for all sorts of other animals, which I think is quite cool. So that's the Paleozoic pack. Next up, this is one of my favorite little pack ideas. I carry this one over from the first game one I did, the one from the first game we have got the oddball packs so these are just animals that are weird and wacky and i love them so this isn't me things that are too weird in terms of like uh additions as in uh really weird um like rigs and like behaviors these are just animals that are weird that can't really fit into anything but i want to see just because they're weird and i love how weird they are so our first one here this is the one from original one it's still here we got Mashikasaurus. so Mashikasaurus was a small carnivore about two meters in length and had quite an extreme jaw with huge front facing teeth can't really see it in this peak uh prehistoric planet reconstruction because it's got big lips as they should do but if you look at uh, other reconstructions of Mashikasaurus with no lips it has really really interesting forward facing teeth and is from madagascar so lives in the same formation as uh uh, Majungasaurus, Bufo, Rapetosaurus, uh, 
Mustona, that big snake, uh, Adamba, Anabatherium. So those kind of really cool animals that were showed. Have you seen the episode Islands of Walking with Dinosaurs? That basically shows the same formation that Mashikasaurus was found in. So a really, really awesome animal. And I think what's really cool as well is what it can hang gameplay-wise. So this could use the fish feeder as well. It'd be the only Spinosaur, um, only non-Spinosaur other than, I think, uh, Dinochirus to use it. And then it could have a wetland need. So I think it'd be cool to give it a wetland need as well for a smaller animal and kind of use that a bit more. And next up... Uh, this was my replacement for Skeletosaurus. Uh, it's a more recently described animal. It's only discovered in 2022. And, um, or only described in 2022. We've got Jacopil. So Jacopil was quite a small herbivore, about a meter and a half long. Compared to the Homocephalae and Compsognathus in size, or Microcerratus as well. Uh, but it's a basal thyreophoran, so it is quite basal to that group of thyreophorans, as I mentioned, the, uh, the uh, Kylosaurs and Stegosaurs. Same with uh, Skeletosaurus, actually quite closely related, but it's from the Middle Cretaceous. So it has a, basically a ghost lineage or a Lazaron taxon. So we don't know what happened between Skeletosaurus, which lived in the like early to middle Jurassic, and then to the Middle Cretaceous. It's like a 70, 80 million year g- gap, and we're just like, where the hell do these come from? But I think what really makes it interesting is that it's bipedal. So it's like very much like your little bipedal dinosaurs, like homocephaly, things like that. But it's also really spiky, covered in osteoderms. And we have preserved osteoderms with the specimen so i think that really makes it really weird and interesting and i think that just makes it so cool it's like a really spiky little guy and i love him for it and he's real cute and that's why i think he deserves to be in the game but also lived in the same formation with giganotosaurus so uh is from the cardonas formation of if you say that so lived with animals like Gig- uh, giganotosaurus and uh, um uh andosaurus which is a big sauropod kind of like argentinosaurus but not really uh those kind of animals so yeah, another really cool animal, another little oddball. We never expected to find it. It's a Lazarus taxon. It's bipedal, but it's also covered in spikes. So I think that really makes it a good addition to the oddball pack. Uh, the only thing that I think Skeletosaurus has over it is that it's bigger. Because uh, it's bipedal as well. Uh, or potentially bipedal or quadrupedal. It could be like a little bit of a mix of both. But the only thing it has on it is bigger. So that could be a good replacement for Jacopil if it's too small. But I think Jacopil is the best addition. And then we've got for the oddballs, I didn't add in the uh, pterosaur, because I think the pterosaurs are already pretty well represented in my packs. But I've gone with a couple really, really cool marine animals, which I'm quite excited to talk about. So for the first oddball, we've got Dacosaurus. So Dacosaurus was a medium-sized marine reptile, about five meters or so, and has been found worldwide. And what really makes it weird as well, it looks like a mosasaur or anything like that, uh, but it's actually a marine crocodile. So they're during the Jurassic and the early Cretaceous, there were lots of marine crocodilians, like uh, Metriorhynchus and Dacosaurus is another great example, probably one of the two more famous ones. And what really makes it interesting as well, it's got that big boxy head, uh, makes it look quite different from a lot of its relatives as well, so it's weird even among marine crocodilians. A lot of them have much more like gharial or typical crocodilian snouts that are much more well adapted for catching fish. These guys had big boxy heads, but they're also quite highly requested, so it's an animal I think a lot of people would like to see, so I think Dacosaurus Dacosaurus is a great addition. I suppose you could supplement it with, um, or replace it with Metriocanthosaurus, or not Metriocanthosaurus, Metriorhynchus. Uh, Metriorhynchus is very interesting, and it's basically just a sea, a sea gharial that's like, like smooth skin with the big tail. It's like, it's basically Dacosaurus with a, uh, like a normal crocodile head instead of that big boxy head that it's got. So I think Dacosaurus, being weird, is a good addition there. And this one I personally love. This was Tosh's work. Tosh did a really great job with this guy. So this is a Bissosaurus. So Bissosaurus is a medium-sized marine reptile. It's a cryptoclidid, so it's related to cryptoclidus and all those kind of animals. And it's from the early Cretaceous. It gets to about 7 meters long. But what really makes it weird is that unlike a lot of other marine reptiles we find that tend to be more shallow or open water, these guys show a lot of adaptations similar to marine, uh, more modern beaked whales and sperm whales, is that they were deep sea divers. So they had really heavy gastralia or belly ribs that allowed them to sink. They've got a lot of traits that are called pedomorphic traits, which means they look like babies almost as adults, which is weird but a lot of slow animals, and they also had potentially had a slow sedentary lifestyle, so potentially would have been at the bottom of the ocean, kind of slowly waiting and hunting for prey, so I think it's a really, really cool addition. Uh, because of its ecology, 
And because of that ecology, it's a deep sea animal. If you know anything about the deep sea, you know they all look really weird and ugly. So I think the designs could really go wild, wild and be creative with Abyssosaurus. You could base them off like dragon eels. Uh, I mean, keep it accurate-ish, but you could have like dragon eels. Um, what other deep sea animals? You've got all of those viper fish, uh, angular fish. Uh, this is based off vampire squids because vampire squids are quite red, uh, red as well. So I think you really could come up with some really cool, interesting designs and really make it an interesting looking like, deep sea animal and really set it apart from a lot of the other uh, reptiles and the uh, marine reptiles in the game and give us another like mid sized ichthyosaur, uh, not ichthyosaur, plesiosaur. So really cool. But um, last but certainly not least, we have got the Prehistoric Marine Species Pack 2. I couldn't come up with a more creative name, but I think because the marine species need so much more attention and all that, I think this is actually, uh, you could call it the another marine pack. I'm sure there's a more creative name you can come up with. But I think this adds, uh, really helps us, along with the other pads, really complete the diversity of what we really want from the lagoons and uh, adds in that. I imagine there could be lagoon updates come up with this as well. So I think this is what adds a lot, in my opinion. So first up, we've got Platycarpus. So Platycarpus is a medium marine reptile, a medium mosasaur, about five meters long. So a lot smaller than both Tylosaurus and the Mosasaurus. And it's typically found in North America, Europe, and Africa. It's quite well known in terms of its anatomy. It's one of the more famous smaller um, smaller mosasaurs because you think tylosaurus and mosasaurus but the when you normally mention those you think of like platycarpus globodens D uh, dallosaurus or halosaurus those are the other more famous ones but platycarpus i think is kind of the most general one i was actually thinking of substituting it for globodens and globodens is another weirdo it's very much like platycarpus in size but it actually is well adapted for eating it's got the globe shaped teeth really well adapted for eating hard shelled foods so Durafagus as well, and could use the sea, uh, she, the seashell feeder or the shellfish feeder, very similar to Placodus. But I think maybe just a little, be, be a little bit more restrained and generalist with this. We just get a small mosasaur, uh, that's not quite as big as the other ones. It could be a bit more playful things like that. It's quite well known as well. We have pretty well preserved specimens. We pretty good idea, and we a lot of our um, f skin impressions from mosasaurs come from Platycarpus. And it adds just a bit more mosasaur diversity. Uh, you could, I, I do think there's a good case you could replace it with globodens, but this is kind of your more generalist little baby one. It's they're basically the same, other than globodens would probably you be able to use the uh, the uh, shellfish feeder. So that's the really only difference between them. But yeah, both would be great additions. But for here, I picked platycarpus. And next up, this is another really cool one. We've got Dolly Karinkops. So Dolly Karinkops is even smaller, a small marine reptile, about three meters long, so not very big, and found in North America. So Dolly Karinkops is a really interesting group that's not really represented in the game, but it is a uh, plesiosaur. So the group it is is called a polycatylid. So polycatylids were short-necked plesiosaurs. They were a group of plesiosaurs. Uh, that kind of evolved and have convergently evolved with pliosaurs. So their necks got shorter and their heads got bigger. So they look very superficially like a pliosaur, but they're actually more closely related genetically and uh, phylogenetically to uh, your typical plesiosaurs like Elasmosaurus and um, you know Cryptoclitus and Plesiosaurus and animals like that, rather than pliosaurs like Leopleurodon and Kronosaurus, which I think is really interesting. So it's like... You kind of get the best of both worlds because you get more plesiosaurs, but you used to get another animal that looks a lot like a pliosaur that's smaller, about three meters or so. So you kind of get those best of both worlds with Dolly Karin Cops. And plus, it's quite a famous animal, so it's uh, probably one of the more famous ones. It's seen in Pre Sea Monsters of Prehistoric Adventure, which is quite a popular documentary. And it's very cute. It's got big round bodies. I could imagine it could be very playful. You could very model it off dolphins and jump around and beach itself and uh, breach itself out of the water. I think that could be a really, really cute addition and very fast and speedy around. Very cool. As, as I mentioned, it'll be an active pursuit predator. So I think in terms of personality, you could very much lean into the dolphin a bit, which I think would be cool. A really, really cool one. Make it quite social. Maybe even like herd together with other animals. I think that'd be quite cool. So yeah, that's that one there. And these two, I really wanted to add because I really want to get more filter feeders. So uh, this one, uh, first up, we've got Titanicthes. So Titanicthes is a, another large placoderm fish. It's kind of the next largest compared to uh, 
Dunkleosteus, so they're kind of in the same size range. Uh, due to the new study, there has been estimates put at about 4 meters, but if you go with older estimates, put them about 7 meters. Kind of the same with Dunkleosteus, between kind of 7 to 10 meters even, but uh, if we're going with the more modern estimates, we've got about um, kind of 4 meters in the same vein as Dunkleosteus. Uh, with the most recent 22, you know, they shrunk the dunk, you know, though it's probably much more accurate, I'd say. I'm, I'm pretty confident with the study's results, but a lot of people just don't like that they shrunk the dunk. But yeah, this guy is quite a cool animal. There's lots of species found around the world, uh, mainly in North America, Europe, and Africa. Uh, and it's comparable, as I mentioned, to dunk, uh, dunk in size. But being what really interesting as well is while Dunkleosteus was a big macro predator, potentially hunting on other placoderms and sharks and potentially other large squids and uh, sea uh, ripped um, sea scorpions and things like that. Very large macro predator. These guys were actually filter feeders. So they were basically the uh, baleen whale or your minke to your orca. So they would have been like, the, it's the best comparison, minke whales so filter feeders. Uh, very much kind of opening their mouths and letting uh, their gills or potentially their teeth helping to filter uh, zooplankton or small fish out of the ecosystem or out of the water that it was going through its mouth and kind of just flushed it out and then swallowed it so very interesting ecology and was the first known filter feeder uh, or first known large filter feeder and it was an opportunity as well to bring a new feeder so I put the anchovy or zooplankton uh, feeder so most kind of filter feeders feed on both small fish and zooplankton uh, most uh, of your big whales will feed on small fish but uh, there's also blue whales which pretty much nearly spe specialize on krill uh, some like uh, whale sharks will feed on both small fish and zooplankton so I imagine they're very much like a whale shark in that regard and we've got another filter feeder as well so we're going back from the Devonian we're going forward in time to the Jurassic we've got another big famous Jurassic kind of filter feeder the largest filter feeder we know of from the Mesozoic we've got lead sickies so this was quite a large ray fin fish uh, estimates range for there were estimates that put it as big as a blue whale but that's probably not likely most recent estimates put it between 9 to 16 meters which is comparable in size to a humpback whale so it's definitely nothing to sneeze at but still a really really big animal and it's found in Europe and I was meant to say South America but North it's found in South America that's my uh, typing for you I always have a few spelling mistakes to be honest but I uh, found in South America Glasgow Rake is found there and it's the largest bony fish in history so the biggest fish in history was Megalodon and then pretty much lead sectors is the largest bony fish that includes as I mentioned ray fin fish so any fish with bones for comparison the largest ray fin fish today is the Mola Mola which is about three tons I think about four meters long it's like the big pancake one also known as a sunfish they get to a few tons but nothing compared to this guy so this is a very weird and interesting animal it was basically the uh mesozoic answer to a like filter feeding whale like a right whale or a blue whale or something like that so i think it's definitely worth that addition and also uses that filter feeder so we get that filter feeder there's they could put a little bit more effort because they're using two animals to justify it we get this really cool filter feeder can swim around with its mouth open uh through the filter feeder uh, and kind of eat all these little fish and all these small animals, small zooplankton. So it really just really adds a lot more. It could be much more slow swimmer, not worried about going too fast. I think that just adds a lot more to the game. And we get two fish, so um, and we get another placoderm as well. So really, I think, caps that diversity, and I think it's really, really good. The only animal that I can think is really missing is the one from the movie, is Microceratus, uh, which is true. But anyway... I think this is kind of we finished up. So, thank you guys for watching. So, uh, don't forget to leave a like and you know subscribe to my channel, all that, and leave your thoughts in the comments. I love to hear your opinions. As you can see, some of them changed quite a bit. Uh, there were some animals I wanted to put other places, uh, but I think you know sometimes you just have to. Uh, um, sometimes you just have to commit to something and I think there's a few other animals that I probably could change around still. I've as I mentioned, globidens and. Globidensum uh, platycarpus, and then you've also got Lishawikia and Placerius. Placerius is more famous, but Lishawikia is bigger, uh, which I think makes it more interesting. But of course, yep, if you guys have your own opinions and thoughts, 
uh, or maybe your own packs that you want to give. I didn't want to touch Cetazoics because I know a lot of people want me to do or would want that. I, 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 because we've got Smilodon, but I'm not sure how realistically. I thought about doing hybrids as well, but I don't really want really to make up hybrids or steal hybrids from other games. But I think, considering what the game's going with no hybrids and no Cetazoics, I think this is probably the best case scenario of what we could get, in my opinion, and some really cool animals that really fill out the diversity of animals already in game. So, yeah, I, uh, Really, really, really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified below anything. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye-bye.